uh, the one organized with uh, together with Ikrom and the one uh, organized together with the Prince Klaus Fund um, two weeks ago. This series uh, of talks uh, are uh, prepared in the frame of the International Master in Cultural Property Protection in Crisis Response uh, held by the University of Torino in collaboration with the Italian Army, the Carabinieri Army, and uh, a list of a long list of uh, uh, partners and institutions working in this field. Um, today it will be a very, a very dense and interesting presentation. And uh, for introducing our guest speaker, I'm leaving the floor to Bayan Chanem, who was one of our first students uh, in the first edition of the master from Palestine. I remember uh, very well also your, your project, which was uh, about uh, uh, heritage of Palestine refugees. Uh, Bayan, the floor is yours. Thanks, of course, for your availability and the floor is yours. Hi, thank you, Alessio, for introducing this. And uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, I hope everyone is doing well with the situation and so on. So um, it's Bayan Janem, as Alessio said. Um, uh, I am from Palestine. Um, uh, well, first, I didn't know how to start or maybe what to say or maybe what to tell you about. But uh, when I was thinking, I was, OK, I think in my life I got two luck cards and I think one of those luck cards was being able to be part of this master course and being one of the participants actually of this um, of this master. Um, you can you can never imagine how it enriched my long, my knowledge uh, in many areas whether from tangible heritage or intangible heritage or from the project point of view of doing those or uh, maybe uh, um, developing those uh, with the, uh, those um, uh, those maybe we can say material that we have in, in our countries um, uh, uh, yeah, or from, you know, it was a rich experience from different point of views, whether from lectures or from visits or from, uh, or from the connections that we had during this master. And it was able also to, uh, you know, connect it with uh, international law uh, as my background is law. Uh, I was so lucky to know more about the international law and how it held the cultural heritage from different perspectives, um, which opened this experience actually opened for me and viewed for me or maybe uh, I gained the second luck card, which was being one of the employees of UNESCO National Office for Palestine. Um, for example, I was able and uh, capable to be part of the revising team uh, for the laws that uh, they are planning to endorse regarding the intangible cultural heritage uh, and being able to have many um, or to like um, uh, uh, ruin, uh, I mean, uh, to uh, have being part of the people who were doing uh, many acti activities that can safeguard the intangible cultural heritage. Um, for everyone who can have a chance to be part of this master, I mean, he will absolutely have the the like the the, the benefit from it, like the best. Uh, of it and uh, comprising it with his own experience will help a lot uh, uh, also. So uh, I think that's all what I can say. And I mean, I would like to say more, but this is in general what um, this master actually uh, helped me or what I, how, how I benefit from, had the benefit from it. So I will leave the floor maybe to Maria so she can go ahead and complete the talk. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Bayan. Uh, good, uh, 
Good afternoon or good morning to everyone, depending on uh, where you are connected from. Uh, I personally, I'm from connected from Iraq. Uh, my name is Maria and I work for the UNESCO office in Iraq. Uh, let me share the screen. Can everyone see my screen? Yeah. Okay. It's not going, okay. Uh, so uh, my presentation uh, relates uh, to the ongoing UNESCO work in Mosul, Iraq, where we are uh, trying to support the Iraqi government in its efforts to reconstruct and rehabilitate the city's urban heritage and landmarks after the end of the conflict in 2017. Um, in fact, uh, the city of Mosul, meaning in Arabic, the linking point, has been for millennia a strategic crossing and a commercial and cultural link between north, south, east, and west. Its history has been characterized since its origins uh, by a multi-religious and multicultural environment where different groups have been peacefully coexisting. This is, of course, very well reflected in its urban heritage, which includes mosques, but also a number of churches and synagogues. Unfortunately, Mosul became the target of violent extremism, and in 2014, the conflict struck the city. Three devastating years of conflict passed from 2014 to 2017, leaving the old city of Mosul in ruins. Its heritage sites re reduced to rubble, religious monuments and cultural antiquities uh, damaged, and thousands of its inhabitants displaced, leaving them scared and with immense humanitarian needs. It is to respond to these needs that the UNESCO Director General, Madame Azoulay, launched uh, back in February 2018, the initiative revived the spirit of Mosul for the recovery of one of the <clears throat> Iraqi's most iconic cities. Reviving Mosul is not only about reconstructing heritage sites, it is about empowering um, people the population as agents of change involved in the process of rebuilding their own city through cultural education. In fact, the initiative, as you can see, is built around three main pillars, uh, heritage um, seen as um, having the reconstruction of urban heritage and historical landmarks as basically uh, a tool to reestablish uh, a peaceful uh, environment and to reestablish social cohesion. Education, meaning basically uh, strengthen the educational system and also re-granting uh, access uh, to education for all. And then of course, the revitalization of, um, uh, of cultural life. Uh, the case that I'm presenting here today is implemented within the framework of the initiative, and it responds specifically to uh, pillar one and three, so heritage and reviving uh, the cultural life in Mosul. This project is funded by the United Arab Emirates, and it is aimed at rebuilding iconic historical landmarks in the old city of Mosul as a tool to foster social cohesion and reconciliation in the post-conflict context. Specifically, the project works on three sites, uh, the Al-Nuri complex and its iconic al haqba minaret dated back to the 12th century, uh, and then the Al-Tahira Syria Catholic Church, um, located in the district of all churches, and then the conventual lady, um, the conventual church of Our Lady of the Hour, also said in Arabic Al Saha Church Complex, uh, both dated back to the second uh, half of the 19th uh, century. Uh, the project started in 2019, and since its first conception, uh, the project did not consider only uh, the reconstruction from the, from the perspective of the physical reinstatement uh, of the lost monuments, rather it includes a strong component of community engagement. In fact, the project is built around two main outcomes. Uh, 
uh, on one side that are, of course, uh, closely interlinked. Uh, on one side, the actual reconstruction of the monuments and the reactivation of the cultural life in Mosul. And on the other side, uh, a strong component of skills development and job creation. Now, uh, the decision of working on historical landmarks is in line with the recognized role that culture can play in a post-disaster, especially post-conflict context. For example, in the recent World Bank UNESCO position paper, the so-called CURE, historical landmarks are specifically mentioned under principle two, which uh, states uh, that Starting the, the reconciliation process with the reconstruction of, of cultural landmarks and places of significance to the local community can be prioritized because this can be seen as focal points of so in the social recovery process. Um, in fact, you, you notice that the project includes a mosque and it includes also two churches. Why? Because the spirit of Mosul is a spirit of, of uh, coexistence in between different communities. So the decision of selecting a mosque, but simultaneously two churches, was already just addressing, um, was already addressing uh, this overall scope, uh, even in the selection of the sites to treat. Um, now, uh, the cure also highlights the importance of engaging communities and local governments in every step of the recovery process. In the case of POSUL, uh, the elaboration of a strategy to optimize the involvement of the community in the different stages of the process has been immediately one of the key aspects that we have been trying to address. To do that, we have been trying to answer some key questions. For example, uh, what, is, what does it mean community in the post-conflict Mosul, where, for example, there is an enormous amount of internally displaced people? Which are the target groups? Um, which are the different steps of the process and how the involvement uh, of the different target groups can be modulated? the modalities and at which different stages. To do that, one of the first things that we tried to do was to develop a community engagement plan where basically the process is seen as a circle to inform, to consult, to involve, and then to evaluate. Um, now, uh, of course, uh, these main fields of action in the practical implementation of a project correspond to different activities, which are modulated and implemented in a different way, depending on combined consideration, including at least the target group and the specific, uh, and the specific phases of the project or message to pass. This, in, this includes, of course, uh, communication and awareness, awareness raising activities, which are elaborated based on the target group and message to pass. This includes, of course, also um, cultural activities usually implemented with local organizations and partners. Uh, it includes consultation, which is conducted in different ways, depending on the specific need in terms of projects, phases, and specific activities. Uh, job creation, which is of course one of the best ways to involve and empower the local population, in addition to constituting an important contribution to the social economic recovery. And then of course, uh, training and coaching, um, which is a key aspect to ensure uh, the sustainability of the overall process. All these activities are interlinked uh, because if they are properly implemented, they actually contribute to each other. For example, awareness raising done with local organizations and actors is also a source of job creation. Uh, job creation offers occasions of coaching and on-the-job training, and training is a way to, to raise awareness too. In this presentation, I will, uh, and in specific regard to the Mosul experience, I will focus on two aspects, uh, specifically the consultation and uh, the job creation. Now, an emblematic case to understand the criticality of the consultation process, if we want that the population feels engaged and empowered uh, by the recovery process, um, is 
uh, the case of the uh, Al Nuri complex and of its two uh, main monuments, the Al Nuri prayer hall and the Al Hadba minaret. Uh, now, uh, you can see from these photos uh, the level of damage occurred on uh, both the buildings after the 2017 destruction. I would like here to highlight that uh, these sites were intentionally blown up uh, by uh, the Daesh um, during the last days before uh, the formal uh, liberation of Mosul uh, by the Iraqi forces. Uh, and of course, the site uh, is uh, in a way quite symbolic because it was not only one of the most important uh, uh, landmarks in Mosul even before the occupation by Daesh, but this is the place from which al-Baghdadi actually declared uh, the, 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 the start of the Islamic State. Now, uh, the minaret, you can see the destruction here uh, on, the, on the right side. The minaret basically lost its entire shaft. So what is left now is only the two bases, uh, the upper base, decorated with car bricks, and the lower base. And you can see that even for the two bases on the eastern side, in reality, uh, the, 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 the remains are very much damaged. Uh, the prayer hall too, uh, you can see that only the dome uh, with the pillars underneath uh, is currently left uh, after the explosion. Uh, and um, and, that, and a, a small, very small portion of the, um, of the colonnade uh, on the uh, eastern uh, on the eastern side. Now uh, the sites uh, were left in uh, uh, critical uh, conditions, of course, of uh, structural stability, um, and it was immediately clear that the level of destruction was such that uh, a serious consultation was needed in order to identify the recognized values and to make sure that these were respecting uh, the community expectations and that these values would have led the reconstruction process. Because in reality, when a, a, a monument is damaged by conflict, it's the same for a natural disaster. But I would say that in my experience, conflict brings also other factors to, uh, to be considered. And, uh, and I would say that there is not one way to go, uh, also at the technical level. Uh, in reality, I do think that the best approach is really to understand uh, what's the community expectation, because at the end, the monument represents uh, the cultural identity, which is what we want to bring back through the recovery process. Um, now, uh, the consultation was, of course, done in parallel with uh, urgent operations of site clearance and temporary stabilization. I will go back to that. And of course, it included a thorough uh, historical study uh, run, of course, through uh, and in collaboration with local experts in order to understand and analyze the transformations the complex went through over the centuries. Uh, here, uh, there are a couple of uh, 3D models um, uh, highlighting uh, the main, uh, the, the major transformations the complex went through, and many of them actually happened in recent times. One of the major ones was uh, the fact that the prayer hall was completely reconstructed in 1944, you can see the difference, with completely new uh, architectural features. That some of the building, uh, edu educational and social building that originally were part of the complex were also demolished in this uh, renovation uh, program uh, uh, implemented uh, back uh, in, 19, uh, in 1944, and also the courtyard of the mosque had been uh, almost completely uh, ref uh, uh, refurbished. Um, on the other hand, uh, the minaret uh, didn't go through any major transformation over the century, affecting its overall architectural features. Um, 
Rather, it went through some targeted interventions, especially uh, implemented during the 80s, aimed at mitigating problems related to its over, uh, overall instability. Now, uh, why this is very much important? Uh, it's important because it creates the basis to develop possible reconstruction options that then um, can create, um, in a way, the basis for the consultation process. In addition to that, this is a map, uh, a schematic map, showing the complex, the Alnuri complex. This is the Alatba minaret here. And this is what is left of the prayer hall. Uh, and these are some additional buildings that were uh, part of the complex and mainly serving uh, the, uh, the prayer hall. Um, now, an additional factor that we had to consider when we started developing reconstruction option to be then presented to the community for consultation and final decision uh, was that this is the historical perimeter of the complex, but uh, what is currently our area of work upon a request of the Iraqi government and especially the Sunni endowment who is the owner of the site, is to work on an enlarged area. Now, the, the, this additional area uh, that, is, uh, that you can see on the uh, left side of the slide was originally a beautiful uh, neighborhood of residential houses that unfortunately uh, were um, almost completely destroyed already back in the 90s. And the area before Daesh was used as a parking lot. So uh, the moment the Sunni Waqaf had the possibility of starting a plan of acquisition, they then requested this area to be integrated in the historical perimeter of the complex in order to, um, let's say, re-establish uh, some education, educational and cultural functions that originally were in fact uh, part of the uh, Almuri complex before uh, the renovation done in 1944. Uh, now, of course, uh, in the uh, process, uh, in the decision-making process for selecting the reconstruction options uh, in order to reflect the community values at the maximum extent, um, the project used at first um, the two uh, permanent mechanisms of uh, consultation and coordination already uh, established within uh, its, uh, its framework. And this proved being really uh, critical. Here you can see uh, a photo of one of the consultation conducted in Mosul. Um, the project has two uh, mechanisms of uh, permanent consultation and coordination. Uh, one is called Joint Technical Committee, that's a photo of one of the meeting with them, and it's run at the local level. Uh, so the Joint Technical Committee basically includes uh, representatives of local authorities and institutions, local experts, and also um, representatives of the local communities and NGOs or influencers and activists. Um, what's the rule of the Joint Technical Committee that usually gathers uh, on a quarterly basis? Uh, of course, we can also call some ad hoc uh, meeting if there is something that needs to be urgently discussed. It's basically to provide technical advices on the different stages of the project. Um, the second coordination mechanism that happens at the central level, it is called Joint Steering Committee. The Joint Steering Committee uh, is made up of uh, uh, the Minister of Culture of Iraq, the President of the Sunni Endowment, the President of the Christian Endowment because of the presence of, of the churches, the Provincial uh, Dominican Order, because one of the two churches belongs to uh, the Dominican Order, in fact, uh, and of course the donor. So let's say that the Joint Steering Committee is at the more um, higher level and central level. Uh, it gathers twice a year, and its rule is to endorse or approve strategic decisions and or to provide 
uh, strategic uh, recommendations, as it was, for example, the case for uh, the selected reconstruction options for the two uh, for the two uh, monuments that I presented before. Now, uh, I have to say that not surprisingly for the minaret. That's why the historical study is always very much important. In the case of the uh, Al Habba minaret, uh, basically there was almost uh, an anonymous, I would say, consensus in uh, uh, willing to see the minaret rebuilt, uh, how it was and where it was, because the monument has become so iconic in the mind of people that, of course, the, the answer came almost automatically. Different is the case of the prayer hall that required a little bit more of discussion, even though at the end, the, uh, the answer was to, again, even though the prayer hall in the, in the, in the version um, destroyed by the Daesh is a relatively recent building because it was built in 1944, um, at the end, the decision was to have it rebuilt as it was before the destruction, even though with some, with some uh, improvements. Now, it's important to have these, uh, uh, these committees uh, for two main reasons. And this is, uh, I mean, my direct experience on the ground. First of all, uh, having the committee at the local level, it's not always the case that the expectations at the local level are perfectly in line with, with what, which are the requirements at the central level. Uh, the fact that we have these two committees, one gathering quite regularly, uh, and UNESCO acts as a secretariat for both, um, and we can collect their ideas, we can collect their inputs, and these are submitted uh, officially uh, and on a regular basis to those taking decisions at the central level, in a way ensures that um, local voices are listened, and that there is, um, in a way, a smoother uh, linkage between uh, the local and the central government. Um, now, given the importance of the topic, uh, we decided to enlarge the consultation process, at least in this case, as much as possible. In fact, uh, we consider that uh, the, the, the reconstruction option, the selected reconstruction option would have uh, in a way impacted on the overall community because um, the reconstruction option would have defined uh, the brought back image of the monument. Um, therefore, uh, it would have defined what the community would have seen and perceived as a result of the reconstruction process. Uh, considering that, we decided to launch a community survey uh, done in collaboration with the statistic department of the University of Mosul. Uh, we took the lead, of course, in preparing the questionnaire and uh, uh, organizing the data collection in order to cover what the community of Mosul looks like now. Uh, which is not only the people still living in Mosul, but also those displaced, for example, in camps or, um, or outside Mosul. Because, for example, the Christian community um, is not at the moment uh, present in Mosul anymore. The majority of them, either they are displaced in camps or they are uh, currently uh, living in uh, Erbil. Um, so uh, the survey was conducted partially online and partially in person. Um, and uh, in order to reach, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, all those fragments that might not have an easy access uh, even to internet connection, as the, is the case for the majority of the IDPs. Um, and of course, it targeted different uh, religious backgrounds, gender, ages, and educational levels. Now. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, the result of the survey uh, confirmed a little bit what was the result of the discussion held at the level of the committees with 90% of, uh, the, uh, uh, of the community um, willing to see the Aladba minaret rebuilt in the same position and with the same decoration before its destruction in 2017, and the 87% willing to see it leaning. Um, and then for the mosque, as I mentioned before, 
uh, a lower percentage, but still the majority would like to see it rebuilt as it was before the destruction in 2017 uh, with some, uh, some, some improvements. Um, the result of the survey were uh, presented in a public event that was also online on social media convened at the University of Mosul in order to receive uh, additional uh, uh, additional inputs and also, and also to explain the process, the methodology, and the final out, uh, outputs. Um, this process was very much important because at the end, um, it, uh, it, it, it made the community feeling like part of the decision. Uh, and at, at the same time, it gave us uh, a final confirmation uh, on how to proceed, because of course then, uh, the selected reconstruction options then uh, are guiding now the implementation strategy and also how to deal with the uh, specificity of uh, the required uh, technical solution. Now, um, another uh, critical way to uh, involve the community is, of course, to find ways for them to play an active role in the actual implementation of the activities on the ground. It's to say, to create basically job opportunities. Uh, in the case of this project, uh, the majority of the job opportunities are, of course, related to the fields of uh, history, architecture, engineering, construction, and archaeology. Um, However, uh, when you have to deal to, uh, with uh, a monument that is iconic, the donor that expects you to meet international standards in the actual implementation, and on the other side, you don't have always um, an expertise at the local level that can fully uh, deal with the complexity of uh, such uh, cases. Uh, and so um, there is a need of elaborating um, targeted strategies in order to strike a balance in between um, the technical complexity, um, the expertise that is available at the local level, and at the same time, the overall objective of uh, creating job opportunities for them uh, at the maximum uh, extent. Um, now, I will give an example of uh, what we did uh, at the very beginning. Um, this was the situation of the sites. I showed these images before. You can see that uh, the sites were not even fully accessible because you need also to think about the fact that all this rubble uh, was contaminated rubble, uh, meaning rubble potentially uh, still included unexploded uh, ordinances, uh, which in fact we found. Um, and uh, we had to deal with uh, a problem of ensuring the stability of these monuments. Because when you start removing the rubble and you go close to the monument, uh, you basically induce vibrations. And uh, when the destruction is uh, done at this level, it's the same when you have like uh, huge earthquakes. Uh, of course, the building is not stable. So any portion can suddenly fall down. And this is, of course, something that uh, needs to be absolutely avoided, not only to um, prevent further losses in the original portions is sending, but especially to ensure the safety of those working on site. Um, so um, it was clear that we had to coordinate uh, the demining with the rubber removal and with the temporary stabilization, meaning that this coordinated work uh, was quite complicated. Um, and it required a, a a quite good level of expertise um, and technical knowledge. Now, uh, what we did, uh, we conducted uh, an assessment uh, of the needs, but also of the local expertise uh, available. Uh, and we decided, uh, given the nature of the work, to rely only on local experts and local contractors, but to have a strong uh, supervision of the of works 
Uh, so we decided to enroll uh, a highly uh, qualified expert as supervisor works, and this gave us the possibility to create employment, do the job uh, with a very, very limited uh, involvement of international experts, but at the same time to be sure that the quality we wanted would have been granted. Now, um, the strategy uh, we applied proved to be successful. Uh, you can see uh, the sites, uh, how they look like after the UNESCO intervention, uh, with the, the mining completed, uh, the rubber removed, and uh, the remains uh, temporarily stabilized, uh, which means that now the sites are fully accessible to continue with the next phases of work. Um, of course, the, uh, the, the mining, uh, sorry, the rubber removal uh, included the collection uh, and recovery of historical fragments. And uh, here on the right, you can see a photo of uh, colleagues from the Ministry of Culture, uh, State Boards of Antiquities, Heritage and Antiquities, uh, who have been uh, deploying, um, who has been deploying um, eight archaeologists permanently working with us on site as part of the same team. Uh, and they have been the ones basically identifying the fragments to be collected during the process of the mining and rubber removal. And they have been then uh, uh, the ones doing uh, all the cataloging and inventorying um, uh, with uh, 44,000 bricks recovered from the mineral and uh, uh, 1,100 uh, stone fragments collected from the prayer all to be possibly then reused um, in the reconstruction process. Now, um, this has, uh, here are just uh, some uh, images of uh, the uh, ongoing uh, work uh, during uh, the uh, implementation of uh, this initial phase, so rubber removal, the mining and temporary stabilization. Uh, this is the uh, construction of the wooden structures that we use to support the dome. Uh, I would like to say that uh, these structures are quite complicated. Uh, and uh, all this was done by local carpenters. Uh, we did not have any idea of how to do that when we started the work. But then working under the supervision of our experts, they actually had the opportunity to learn and then they, they went ahead. And at the end, this is the uh, prayer all, uh, how it looked like after the rubber removal and uh, the uh, temporary stabilization. As you can see, I mean, the, 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 the structures, added structures are quite complicated. Um, then uh, we are continuing with this implementation strategy. So trying to uh, basically use uh, the international experts only where, where it is needed and, uh, and to basically bring uh, people with really, really, really high level of expertise so that the locals can have continuous uh, opportunity of uh, on the job training. Uh, here are the uh, ongoing phases. Now we we move to the, for example, um, we move to the uh, next phase, which is the design and the reconstruction. So here you can see uh, again locals with only one international experts practicing the horizontal core drilling in the minaret um, as part of the field investigation campaign that we are currently doing to check the overall stability of the remains. And on the right. The archaeological excavations done to investigate the foundations that are currently ongoing and again done in collaboration with the State Board of Antiquities. Also, this is very much important, like not only work with the uh, local institutions, of course, those having like a relevant field of competence, just as a consultation to meet them in their offices, but actually to involve them in the actual implementation on the ground. Uh, this creates a mutual relation of trust that empowers them, but at the, end, at, at the same time, um, make our works more rooted in the local context. Um, now, uh, this strategy applied so far uh, has generated more than 600 jobs uh, when the overall target of the project is 1,000. 
Um, the project currently is in uh, its third year of implementation, so we still have three years ahead of time. Uh, so we are quite sure that we won't only achieve this target of 1,000 jobs created for the locals, but we will be probably overpass the target by, by the end of the project. As I was mentioning before, the deployment of highly qualified international experts on the ground and the simultaneous presence of local staff deployed on site offers, of course, also continuous occasions of uh, coaching and on-the-job trainings. Um, because we do think that if we don't do that, our work, even if we rebuild the monuments in a perfect way, won't be uh, absolutely sustainable. In fact, in addition to that, we have developed with ICROM a targeted training program only for Mosul that will be rolled out in the next two years. We should start now in June. And uh, that is uh, made up of two tracks, one for local professionals, that is to say archaeologists, architects, and engineers, and uh, track two, that is for local artisans. Um, because as I said, we do believe that uh, training and direct involvement is at the basis of the sustainability of what we do to revive the spirit of Mosul. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Thanks a lot uh, for uh, yeah for all this uh, for sharing your uh, experience, your and your your colleagues uh, and your office uh, experience, uh, and for highlighting uh, the complexity of uh, this kind of uh, work, uh, which is something very relevant uh, to to us. When I say to us, I mean especially the work that we try to do within the frame uh, of the Master in Cultural Property Protection in training uh, professionals for working in context uh, like the one that uh, you just uh, presented. I was personally taking a lot of notes, uh, which I expect to be, I'm sure they will be very useful also for the planning of the next edition of the Master, the third edition of this Master, uh, which will take place uh, uh, starting from uh, this, uh, this autumn. So soon we are opening the, the uh, applications for the next edition. Uh, and uh, I also would like to, to highlight uh, especially um, the, not just the reconstruction side, which is of course uh, essential, but also the, the social reconstruction, the, the recovery, the social community and economic recovery. And also, as you said, uh, uh, the, the right uh, for the people, for these people, but for all of us uh, to access to, to cultural heritage. So the role of community and also uh, how these need to be governed through, through process which are long lasting uh, process. So I'm highlighting these aspects because uh, uh, they are really, uh, they are really coinciding with the work that we are, we are doing. I see connected, uh, the director of the master, Professor Grepi and, uh, and Professor Segre, the deputy director of the master. I see also some of our past students of this master, some of our current students of uh, uh, the other master that we, we have here in Turing on world heritage and cultural property protection and uh, other friends from, from other programs uh, that we are running in, in this period. So I'm, I'm very, I'm very happy about this. Uh, I was also taking some notes and some questions. So I'm asking, of course, since we have, uh, we still have a, a few minutes, I'm asking, of course, to our uh, participants today, if they want, if you want to pose some questions, you can by taking, uh, uh, opening the, the microphone or writing in the chat. But I was receiving some some input also on my on my chat. So let me let me start if I may, uh, by asking you uh, how you, I mean, your office, UNESCO, is uh, uh, planning uh, uh, to, uh, say, to monitor uh, the impacts, not just uh, as now, as per now, as you said, but also for the longer term, uh, for when, uh, hopefully, 
everything or i mean this project will be completed so what's the plan for the the next and 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 uh, and the future in general okay um first of all uh uh, UNESCO is actually working uh, also um, on uh, the urban heritage, meaning that we are not only working on isolated monuments, but we are also working on um, residential houses. Um, now, this makes uh, the intervention and also uh, the opportunities uh, linked to that a little bit more programmatic. Um, as I said before, uh, our effort is actually to, um, on one side, raise awareness about the fact that culture can really have an active role and um, in, in the social economic recovery, I do think. Um, and also uh, that um, it's a long process and it's a process that necessarily at a certain point needs to be run by then. So uh, what we are planning is to, uh, on one side, if and when possible, to keep expanding uh, the support to more and more sectors of the city, to invest more and more on our support to the educational institutions, because as I said, this means ensuring the sustainability. Uh, and then, uh, let's say, consolidate uh, this revived interest and attention for their own culture uh, through an implementation that keeps ongoing and has more and more and more locals and less and less and less internationals involved. Oh, that's uh, that's very interesting. And that was very also clear from uh, what you presented. Let, uh, let me read this question. Uh, from Christoph Schmidt. I am asking uh, Christoph if you want to pose uh, by voice, by your voice, the question to Maria. Just open the microphone. Thank you for having me. It's a very new thing here for me in this setting. And it was very interesting what you said, Maria. And the thing is, um, how can we, can someone from the outside expertise get involved in the this and other things, because I brought up a pretty modern new way of desalination, drying things, stabilizing things, where I at the Herodium in Israel or Palestine, better say, to be correct, through Israel, but you have to go there, but otherwise you can't access. We started something where they said it's not possible and we did it. And the Herodium, they now dig and do a lot of things in the wall paintings we saved and sort of this is the most difficult part perhaps you can do in the world with wall paintings, seco on and seco en fresco. And now I saw this wetness related thing at the at your places there. And I thought, okay, that would be a good idea to get in there before someone else plasters around and then it deteriorates again. And best practice, I don't know where, where you're coming from originally in Italy or so. Um, Palazzo Guerri Consulti is one sustainable thing where they even forgot after 25 years that there's a system from us in there after they nearly ruined it in the first place when digging up that time in 1997 or so. Okay, in Italy, I'm from Rome, so... <laughs> We have, uh, yeah, <laughs> we have to deal with heritage everywhere. Um, look, uh, I mean, in terms of uh, involvement of um, possible external experts or partners, um, UNESCO is usually um, publishing, uh, um, 
there are different uh, typology of advertisements and uh, opportunities that usually we publish in, uh, in our website. Uh, so I recommend to monitor that. Uh, or maybe for you know information about the project and things like that, you might wish to write to me, uh, and then uh, you know we can uh, we can have a chat and see and uh, maybe um, yeah uh, discuss about uh, different possibilities. Alessio can 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 give you my 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 email. I wrote it to you already. The I thing is, they, um, UNESCO or anybody else can't really advertise something they don't know is, exists. That's a bit of a problem. <laughs> because I'm, I, as I said, I come from the outside. I came from a plasma field in electronics and had it solve something. And that was some 30 years ago. And since then, I'm doing that in a, in a sort of a niche, very special things like Audion where they said, okay, you, ne you never dry into the bedrock, and I will dry it into the bedrock. And that they could eliminate what you have also um, power problems there. We eliminated, for example, uh, air conditioning, where they said, if you have people there going through it, so the moisture, I said, I can use it. And things like that, or use uh, natural venting, like in the, the, in the Middle East, very old buildings there, or have the 2000 year old mortar by accident reinvented. So we can use old mortar with, yes, you said, local stuff that works there for the people, with the people. Okay. This is sort of my intention. Uh, I, I, I'm, you, wrote, you wrote to me directly? I yes, in the chat. Ah, in the chat. Okay. No, I thought via email. <laughs> oh, okay. There's <laughs> my email somewhere. Write to me via email. Okay, okay. You can send it to me, please. So we can facilitate the scope of these talks is also to facilitate this kind of connection. So you are very welcome, uh, Christoph. Uh, Thank uh, you. We might uh, help. Giovanna, uh, Giovanna Segre um, wrote, uh, and you want to pose a question? Am I right? Yes, exactly. Very short question. It's, it's a curiosity. Since I'm an economist, I, I noticed that you were mentioning a number of uh, new jobs created, uh, but they were 600 and you would like to arrive to a, a thousand. That's really important. But my question was, but they are they really uh, like kind of permanent positions or, or they are just in the frame of the duration of the project? So there are really positions that will be go on uh, in some way and how or, or how it is this day? Uh, I would say I would say both uh, because some of them uh, are basically people then directly enrolled by the UNESCO office. Uh, so then there is a sort of uh, uh, how to say involvement in the responsibility, the tasks, and also uh, the, the, the typology of contract and also the duration. Uh, some of them, they are more related to, uh, to the project itself because uh, it's, uh, for example, the actual implementation of the activities on the ground. Because of course, uh, you also need to think that um, when you have construction, uh, the majority of the budget is anyway allocated for the construction. So at the end, the majority, the highest number of jobs will be created, especially for the actual implementation of the activities on the ground that in a way have a beginning and an end. Um, but we think that, uh, for example, but the thing is that that's a good question because the thing is also again the sustainability of what we are doing uh, many of those contractors before working with us they have never had any experience in uh, in heritage or in any heritage site so we do hope that through this experience that goes ahead for five or six years and works on the monuments but also on the residential houses they can actually acquire skills and also in a way build a portfolio that that will bring more and more opportunities. 
Yeah, thank you. Okay, I see also Stefania, uh, Stefania Leda is uh, willing to ask something. Stefania, if you want to open your microphone. Yeah, hello everyone. Um, hello, yes, I post a few questions uh, in the feed, in the chat. And I want to ask you, Ms. Sashitozo, uh, if there have been new recent issues related to the cultural property protection in Mosul or in the country in general, and also have you know a general idea of the uh, amount of investments which you've made uh, to uh, implement this project to really help the community and also enable the efficiency of this project. And last thing as related to children, if there have been uh, if there's been any kind of project that help children to understand the value and importance of their heritage. So in order you know, to ensure that in the future of this, uh, all what you are doing can be really, uh, can be really still there and uh, uh, hoping to, you know, to educate these this children to um, keep all this going. Thank you. Uh, okay. So uh, now, in terms of uh, current uh, threats uh, on cultural properties in Iraq, I would say that currently the situation is quite stable. Uh, I would say that, for example, in Mosul, uh, one of the main risks at the moment is actually the demolition because the houses are damaged. And, uh, and then the subsequent uh, speculation and encroachment. This is what I would say. Uh, then there are still some, let's say, consequences ongoing. For example, um, in the museums, especially the archaeological museum of uh, Mosul uh, was badly uh, destroyed and uh, many objects looted. Uh, and of course, these objects have not been uh, actually recovered yet. And uh, of course, as it was the case when I was working in Afghanistan, here in Iraq, when they know that I'm Italian, they keep asking when the Carabinieri can come and help us in recovering <laughs> these stolen objects. Um, then in terms of investment, um, Okay, this uh, project funded by the Emiratis is funded for an overall amount of 50.5 million. Um, the European Union is funded the work that we are doing on the historical houses. At, it's an additional amount of around 10 million. Uh, of course, this is enough just to uh, work on, it seems a lot of money, but it's actually uh, enough to uh, work, unfortunately, in a limited sector of the city. Of course, we have been trying to create synergies between the two projects, not only to optimize the expertise and the, you know, the use of uh, human and financial resources, but also to do something that makes sense for the city. So for example, uh, the houses that we have selected, because of course we don't have the budget to rehabilitate all of them, because your city is very big in reality, and it's uh, in it, it has been uh, badly impacted by the conflict. But before that, it was impressively uh, well preserved. Um, we have decided to work uh, on a group of houses that is basically located in between. Uh, the Al Nuri complex and the Al Tahira church. So, in a way, to use the landmarks included in one project as, um, like, uh, how to say, reference point, and then to work with the EU in the space in between, so that we rehabilitate a sector of the city, uh, kind of creating a sort of heritage path. Uh, I would also like to say that, uh, of course, uh, while the um, monuments, landmarks are uh, public uh, properties, uh, the houses are private properties. So it has been also a very, very interesting and important experience to deal with the private owners um, because we rehabilitate their houses and we bring them back in the city in a way because now they don't have any place to stay. 
So this is also an important aspect of what we are doing. Um, then, uh, can you repeat the last question? Because I couldn't hear you very well. The, the last part of your question that was probably on the future. Uh, it was um, about uh, the existence of any project uh, that can help children to, in a certain way, understand or in order to remind them the importance of all these uh, cultural sites that have been destroyed and, of course, recovered. Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, because uh, you know that uh, all these uh, cultural projects are implemented within the cultural unit, but UNESCO is also a big education unit. Um, and we work uh, in synergy with our, our colleagues from education in order to embed in our cultural programs targeted activities for kids. For example, uh, we are planning now, this should have happened already last year, but uh, of course with COVID, uh, the situation was not easy um, because we weren't even able to uh, go to Mosul for almost seven months, uh, while before from Erbil, I'm going there every two uh, uh, twice a week. Um, so now uh, we are resuming the idea. And for example, just to give you an example, we will uh, organize with schools, uh, primary and secondary schools, visit on sites. Uh, we have developed like a kit for kids uh, in order to explain them uh, in, a, in, a, in a simple way. Uh, about the history of their country, about the history of the site. And we are currently working with the colleagues in education to develop like targeted uh, path across the city. Thank you, Maria. And thank you also for the questions and for this last question, especially, which is something that we really, we really care about the future generation. Um, Talking about this uh, and talking about uh, since we are going to close uh, uh, this session, which was a very, very intense uh, and very, and very dense and very, very fruitful. Um, since you were talking about educa education and you were talking be uh, before about uh, building capacities, uh, I would like to take the occasion uh, to to mention this uh, other initiative that we are going to start uh, i mean we are launching exactly let's say now it's a sort of preview we will launch it better in the following days but uh, applications are officially open let me say which is a a, a week uh, um, five days fully dedicated to heritage crimes and emergencies which is uh, of course uh, uh, the topic uh, we were we have been talking about uh, today and uh, in the other occasion it will take place online in june as you can see from this uh, poster and uh, uh, we will publish very soon uh, the possibility to apply um, into the cultural property protection master website and uh, on our partners uh, websites as well um, let me also say that the next, uh, the next uh, talk of this series uh, will take place on the 21st of May, and we will have as a guest speaker a uh, representative from another very important institution uh, dealing with uh, culture, with heritage, with collection, which is ICOM, the International Council of Museums. Um, and. Uh, and yes, that's it. I would like uh, to say a big thank you to Maria, also on behalf uh, of uh, Professor Greppi and Professor Segre, who are there in, in, in the yes. Thank you. Thank you for, for participating in this initiative. I, I thank you for the invitation. With, I've listened with, with high interest. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you also to our participants. And of course, uh, we, we really uh, would be open uh, and hope to collaborate uh, uh, in the future and to collaborate, I mean, to, to serve possibly uh, to such big uh, challenges uh, like the ones that you described today. Thanks a lot and see you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye, -bye. bye.